Your understanding of the world around you and everyone in it depends on your imagination of how it could be different. The imagination is one of the last uncharted terrains of the human mind. There's still a lot we don't know about it. We know that people can create alternatives to reality. And we all know that alternatives to reality are intriguing in art, in literature, and theater, in cinema. Alternatives to reality entertain us. But recent discoveries in cognitive science research about the human imagination are surprising. And one of the big surprises is that the imagination isn't just for entertainment. The imagination carries out some of the most serious work of the human mind. We all create alternatives to reality very often in our everyday lives. We imagine how things could have turned out differently, if only, especially after bad things happen, like a car accident. We create alternatives to reality to explain the past. We can think about the events that occurred before a bad outcome, and we can work out the causes between those events and the bad outcome. We can imagine that if one of those things hadn't happened, the bad outcome wouldn't have happened either. We create alternatives to reality also to prepare for the future. We make better decisions. We learn from our mistakes how to prevent bad things from happening again because we can imagine alternatives. And those imagined alternatives give rise to various emotional experiences. We experience regret and guilt and hope and relief because we think about the way a situation turned out, we imagine how it could have turned out differently, and in the comparison of the two, the emotion emerges. These imagined alternatives to reality also give rise to our moral and legal judgments and decisions. We allocate blame and fault and responsibility because we can think about not only what someone could have done differently, but also what they should have done differently. And when we lose the ability to imagine alternatives to reality, that is devastating for us. Individuals who acquire brain injuries, particularly to the prefrontal cortex, sometimes unfortunately lose the capacity to spontaneously imagine how things could have turned out differently. And they have difficulty in making decisions, in learning from mistakes, and in allocating blame and fault appropriately. So these are all examples of some of the very serious and important work that the human imagination does for the mind. But there's one other thing that we all need to be able to do that we depend on our imaginations for. We all need to be able to work out what's in someone else's head. We need to be able to figure out what other people are thinking. But taking someone else's perspective is really difficult. It's not something that we're born with. Young children can't do it. It has to develop over the course of childhood. By the age of four to five years, young children begin to appreciate that other people may have a different understanding of the world from them. They begin to get that their friend may have a mistaken belief about where objects are or what objects are made of. By the age of seven to eight years, young children begin to appreciate that others might have a different understanding, not just of the physical world, but also of the mental world. They begin to get that their friend might have mistaken beliefs about what someone else is thinking, about what's the reasons for their actions, about what's going on in their minds. And that ability to mind read, to work out what's in someone else's head, depends on our ability to imagine alternatives to reality as we understand it. Here's one example of that. 
we invited young children to listen to stories. They listened to them over earphones and they saw pictures corresponding to them on screen. They heard lots of different stories about lots of different everyday events. Here's one example. They looked at pictures and were told, in the bedroom, John sees Anne picking up toys. She says she wants to find her ball to play with it. John goes into the kitchen, and while he's away, Anne's mother tells her to tidy her room. When John comes back, he sees Anne picking up toys. We ask children a question about an imagined alternative to reality. If Anne's mother hadn't told her to tidy her room, what would have been the reason that she was picking up toys? We also asked them a question about mind reading. We asked them, what will John believe is the reason that Anne is picking up toys? Here's how they managed with the imagination questions. What would have been the reason if her mother hadn't told her to pick up toys? You can see that the young children at six years of age have real difficulty answering imagination questions correctly. By eight years of age, they're much better at it, and at 10, they're almost perfect. Here's how they fare on the mind reading questions. What will John believe is the reason that Anne's picking up toys? You can see again that the six-year-olds are having real difficulty answering mind reading questions correctly. And you can also see that they're having more difficulty with the mind reading questions than with the imagination questions. Children's imagination skills develop before their mind reading skills. The two are really very closely correlated. Children generally will answer both sorts of questions correctly or they'll get neither sort of question correct. In the transition period, we sometimes see children who are able to answer imagination questions and not able to answer the mind reading questions, but we just don't tend to see children who can answer mind reading questions so they can take someone else's perspective, but they can't answer the imagination questions. They can't uh, imagine how things could have turned out differently. And if the development of those imagination skills is delayed for one reason or another, then so too is the development of mind reading skills. That happens with children with autistic spectrum disorder. So here's how children with high functioning autism and Asperger's syndrome fared when we asked them the imagination question. If Anne's mother hadn't told her to tidy her room, what would have been the reason she was picking up toys? You can see that the six-year-olds have real difficulty with this question, but you can also see now that the eight-year-olds are having difficulty with this question, unlike the typically developing children. Here's how they fare with the mind-reading question. Again, you can see that the six-year-olds are having difficulty with it, and at eight years, they're having difficulty with it, again, unlike the typically developing children. And you can also see that once again, their imagination outstrips their mind reading skill. And importantly, you can also see that by 10 years of age, they're beginning to get good at both. This is a developmental delay, but otherwise the shape of the development of their imagination and mind reading skills is the same as for children who are developing typically. So this is one example of the very serious work that the imagination does for the mind. It enables us to take someone else's perspective, to work out what other people are thinking, because we can imagine alternatives to reality as we understand it. Now, there's a profound consequence of these discoveries in cognitive science that the imagination does serious work. And that consequence is that imagination and reason are not opposites. Creativity and logic are not in conflict. 
Instead, it seems to be the case that imagination and rationality rely on the same sorts of computations within the human mind. Let me give you an example of that. We all have difficulties with certain logical inferences. So suppose a friend of yours is describing the contents of a nearby shop and says something about what's possibly there. If there are oranges, there are pears. And then suppose subsequently you discover that in fact there are no pears in that shop. What can you infer? Most people who we ask say that they can infer that there are no oranges. About half of the people we ask will make that inference. But the other half of people who we ask to make this inference will say that they can't infer anything about whether there are oranges or no oranges. The difficulty with this inference seems to arise because people have limited working memories and so we tend to construct just a single mental model corresponding to what has been described to us in conversation. So we tend to think just about the oranges and pears. We don't think about any other possibility. That all changes when our imagination is engaged. So if your friend, when they were describing what might be in the nearby shop, had instead said something about an alternative to reality, and it said if there had been oranges, there would have been pears. Now when you're told that there are no pears in the shop, everyone we ask says very readily that there are no oranges. That inference seems to be very easy to make when it's couched in terms of alternatives to reality. Our imagination allows us to overcome the limitations in our working memory. It allows us to envisage multiple alternatives simultaneously. So we are able to think about reality and an alternative to reality at the same time. Now one way to examine that is to simply look at where people look when they listen to stories that include something about an alternative to reality. So we asked adults to listen to simple stories about lots of different everyday events. They listened to the stories over earphones and they saw on screen very simple visual displays. And tiny cameras recorded very precisely where their eyes moved in those visual displays so that we could see what people are looking at and figure out what they're thinking about as they're hearing about an alternative to reality. So in the course of these stories, they'd hear something about a possibility, like if there are oranges, there are pears, and they'd see an array, a visual array of simple images, like an orange and a pear, an orange and a pear with a cross strike through it, an image of an apple and a strawberry, and an image of no apple and no strawberry. And here's what they look at when they're listening to the possibility, if there are oranges, there are pears. They start out looking at all of the four images, but very rapidly, within a matter of milliseconds, as they hear about the possibility, if there are oranges, there are pears, their eyes move to the image of the orange and the pear and stay focused on that throughout. Their eyes don't move to the other three images. You see a very different picture when instead the story contains a reference to an alternative to reality. If instead they heard, if there had been oranges, there would have been pears. <coughs> now what you see is, once again they start out looking at all four images, but they begin, their eyes move to the image of the orange and the pear, and the image of no orange and no pear. And their eyes stay focused on those two images and they don't pay attention to the other two images throughout hearing about that alternative to reality. And so this is an example of how our imagination seems to allow us to keep multiple alternatives in mind. It allows us to overcome our working memory limitations, and it's in that way that the imagination helps us to reason. <coughs> 
And these are some of the reasons why cognitive scientists are now beginning to conclude that the imagination, far from being an optional extra for our amusement, is in fact at the very core of our cognition. So next time you want to understand something, the world around you or the people in it, try creating an alternative to reality. Try imagining how things could have been different. Use your imagination. It's more useful than you may think. Thank you.